or welcome to the reading of the book At Your Command by Neville Goddard. My name is Anse and I'll be reading this along with you. So go ahead, grab yourself your cup of tea, coffee, water, get comfortable, and let's jump right in. Introduction. This book contains the very essence of the principle of expression. Had I cared to, I could have expanded it into a book of several hundred pages, but such expansion would have defeated the purpose of this book. Commands to be effective must be short and to the point. The greatest command ever recorded is found in the few simple words, and God said, let there be light. In keeping with this principle, I now give to you, the reader, in these few pages, the truth as it was revealed to me. Neville Chapter 1 At Your Command Can man decree a thing and have it come to pass? Most decidedly, he can. Man has always decreed that which has appeared in his world and is today decreeing that which is appearing in his world and shall continue to do as long as man is conscious of being man. Not one thing has ever happened in man's world but what man decreed that it should. This you may deny, but try as you will you cannot disprove it. For this decreeing is based upon a changeless principle. You do not command things to appear by your words or loud affirmations. Such vain repetition is more often than not confirmation of the opposite. Decreeing is ever done in consciousness. That is, every man is conscious of being that which he has decreed himself to be. The dumb man without using words is conscious of being dumb. Therefore, he is decreeing himself to be dumb. When the Bible is read in this light, you will find it to be the greatest scientific book ever written. Instead of looking upon the Bible as the historical record of an ancient civilization or the biography of the unusual life of Jesus, see it as a great psychological drama taking place in the consciousness of man. Claim it as your own and you will suddenly transform your world from the barren deserts of Egypt to the promised land of Canaan. Everyone can agree with the statement that all things were made by God and without him, there is nothing made that is made. But what man does not agree upon is the identity of God. All the churches and priesthoods of the world disagree as to the identity and true nature of God. The Bible proves beyond the shadow of doubt that Moses and the prophets were in 100% accord as to the identity and nature of God. And Jesus' life and teachings are in agreement with the findings of the prophets of old. Moses discovered God to be man's awareness of being. When he declared these little understood words, I am, had sent me unto you. David sang in his Psalms, Be still and know that I am God. Isaiah declared, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee. Though thou hast not known me, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. 
The awareness of being as God is stated hundreds of times in the New Testament. To name but a few, I am the shepherd, I am the door, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, I am the Alpha and Omega, I am the beginning and the end. And again, whom do you say that I am? It is not stated, I, Jesus, am the door. I, Jesus, am the way, nor is it said, whom do you say that I, Jesus, am? It is clearly stated, I am the way. The awareness of being is the door through which the manifestations of life pass into the world of form. Consciousness is the resurrecting power, resurrecting that which man is conscious of being. Man is ever outpicturing that which he is conscious of being. This is the truth that makes man free, for man is always self-imprisoned or self-freed. If you, the reader, will give up all of your former beliefs in the God apart from yourself and claim God as your awareness of being as Jesus and the prophets did, you will transform your world with the realization that I and my Father are one. This statement, I and my Father are one, but my Father is greater than I, seems very confusing, but if interpreted in the light of what we have just said concerning the identity of God, you'll find it very revealing. Consciousness being God is as Father. The thing that you are conscious of being is the Son bearing witness of His Father. It is like the conceiver and its conceptions. The conceiver is ever greater than his conceptions, yet ever remains one with his conception. For instance, before you are conscious of being man, you are first conscious of being. Then you become conscious of being man, yet you remain as conceiver greater than your conception man. Jesus discovered this glorious truth and declared himself to be one with God, not a God that man had fashioned, for he never recognized such a God. He said, if any man should ever come saying, look here or look there, believe them not, for the kingdom of God is within you. Heaven is within you. Therefore, when it's recorded that he went unto his father, it is telling you that he rose in consciousness to the point where he was just conscious of being, thus transcending the limitations of his present conception of himself called Jesus. In the awareness of being all things are possible, he said, you shall decree a thing and it shall come to pass. This is his decree, rising in consciousness to the naturalness of being the thing desired. As he expressed it, and I, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men unto me. If I be lifted up in consciousness to the naturalness of the thing desired, I will draw the manifestation of that desired unto me. For he states, No man comes unto me, save the Father within me draws him, and I and the Father are one. Therefore, consciousness is the Father that is drawing the manifestations of life unto you. You are, at this very moment, drawing into your world that which you are now conscious of being. Now you can see what it's meant by, you must be born again. If you are dissatisfied with your present expression in life, the only way to change it 
is to take your attention away from that which seems so real to you and rise in consciousness to that which you desire to be. You cannot serve two masters. Therefore, to take your attention from one state of consciousness and place it upon another is to die to one and live to the other. The question, whom do you say that I am, is not addressed to a man called Peter, by one called Jesus. This is the eternal question addressed to oneself by one's true being. In other words, whom do you say that you are? For your conviction of yourself, your opinion of yourself will determine your expression in life. He states, you believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, it is the me within you that is this God. Praying then is seen to be recognizing yourself to be that which you now desire, rather than accepting form of petitioning a God that does not exist for that which you now desire. Praying to be successful must be claiming rather than begging. So can't you see why millions of prayers are unanswered? Men pray to a God that does not exist. For instance, to be conscious of being poor and to pray to a God for riches is to be rewarded with that which you are conscious of being, which is poverty. Prayers to be successful must be claiming rather than begging. So if you would pray for riches, turn from your picture of poverty by denying the very evidence of your senses and assume the nature of being wealthy. We are told when you pray, go within in secret and shut the door and that which your father sees in secret, with that will he reward you openly. We have identified the Father to be the awareness of being. We have also identified the door to be the awareness of being. So shutting the door is shutting out that which I am now aware of being and claiming myself to be that which I desire to be. The very moment my claim is established to the point of conviction, that moment I begin to draw onto myself the evidence of my claim. Do not question the how of these things appearing, for no man knows that way. That is, no manifestation knows how the things desired will appear. Consciousness is the way or door through which things appear. He said, I am the way, not I, John Smith, am the way, but I am. The awareness of being is the way through which the thing shall come. The signs always follow, they never proceed. Things have no reality other than in consciousness. Therefore, get the consciousness first and the thing is compelled to appear. You are told, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all things shall be added unto you. Get first the consciousness of the thing you are seeking, and leave the things alone. This is what is meant by, You shall decree a thing, and it shall come to pass. Apply this principle and you will know what it is to prove me and see. The story of Mary is the story of every man. Mary was not a woman giving birth in some miraculous way to one called Jesus. Mary is the awareness of being that ever remains virgin, no matter how many desires it gives birth to. Right now, look upon yourself as Virgin Mary, being impregnated by yourself through the medium of desire, becoming one 
with your desire to the point of embodying or giving birth to your desire. For instance, it is said of Mary, whom you now know to be yourself, that she knew not a man, yet she conceived. That is, you, John Smith, have no reason to believe that that which you now desire is possible. But having discovered your awareness of being to be God, you make this awareness your husband and conceive a man-child manifestation of the Lord. For thy maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Lord God of the whole earth shall he be called. Your ideal or ambition is this conception. The first command to her, which is now to yourself, is, Go, tell no man. That is, do not discuss your ambitions or desires with another, for the other will only echo your present fears. Secrecy is the first law to be observed in realizing your desire. The second, as we are told in the story of Mary, is to magnify the Lord. We have identified the Lord as your awareness of being. Therefore, to magnify the Lord is to revalue or expand one's present conception of oneself to the point where this re-evaluation becomes natural. When this naturalness is attained, you give birth by becoming that which you are one with in consciousness. The story of creation is given us in digest forms in the first chapter of John. Things live only as long as I am aware of being them. In the beginning was the word. Now this very second is the beginning spoken of. It is the beginning of an urge, a desire. The word is the desire swimming around in your consciousness, seeking embodiment. The urge of itself has no reality, for I am or the awareness of being is the only reality. Things live only as long as I am aware of being them. So to realize one's desire, the second line of this first verse of John must be applied. That is, and the word was with God. The word or desire must be fixed or united with consciousness to give it reality. The awareness becomes aware of being the thing desired, thereby nailing itself upon the form of conception and giving life unto its conception or resurrecting that which was hitherto a dead or unfulfilled desire. Two shall agree as touching anything, and it shall be established on earth. This agreement is never made between two persons. It is between the awareness and the thing desired. You are now conscious of being, so you are actually saying to yourself without using words, I am. Now, if it is a state of health that you are desirous of attaining, before you have any evidence of your health in your world, you begin to feel yourself to be healthy. And the second the feeling I am healthy is attained, the two have agreed. That is, I am and health have agreed to be one, and this agreement ever results in the birth of a child which is the thing agreed upon, in this case, health. And because I made the agreement, I expressed the thing agreed. So you can see why Moses stated, I am had sent me. For what being other than I am could send you into expression? None, for I am the way beside me, there is no other. If you take the wings of the morning and fly into the onomous parts of the world, or if you make your bed in hell, you will still be aware of being. 
You are ever sent into expression by your awareness and your expression is ever that which you are aware of being. Again, Moses stated, I am that I am. Now here is something to always bear in mind. You cannot put new wine in all bottles or new patches upon all garments. That is, you cannot take with you into the new consciousness any part of the old man. All of your present beliefs, fears, and limitations are weights that bind you to your present level of consciousness. If you would transcend this level, you must leave behind all that is now your present self or conception of yourself. To do this, you take your attention away from all that is now your problem or limitation and dwell upon just being. That is, you say silently but feelingly to yourself, I am. Do not condition this awareness as yet. Just declare yourself to be and continue to do so until you are lost in the feeling of just being, faceless and formless. When this expansion of consciousness is attained, then within this formless deep of yourself, give form to the new concept by feeling yourself to be that which you desire to be. You will find within this deep of yourself all things are divinely possible. Everything in this world which you can conceive of being is to you. Within this present formless awareness, a most natural attainment. The invitation given us in scripture is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The body being your former conception of yourself and the Lord, your awareness of being. This is what is meant when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, for except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That is, except you leave behind your present conception of yourself and assume the nature of the new birth you will continue to outpicture your present limitations. The only way to change your expressions of life is to change your consciousness. For consciousness is the reality that eternally solidifies itself in the things round about you. Man's world in every detail is his consciousness outpictured. You can no more change your environmental world by destroying things than you can your reflection by destroying the mirror. Your environment and all within it reflects that which you are in consciousness. As long as you continue to be that in consciousness, so long will you continue to outpicture it in your world. Knowing this, Begin to revalue yourself. Man has placed too little value upon himself. In the book of Numbers, you will read, In that day, there were giants in the land, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and we were in their sight as grasshoppers. This does not mean a time in the dim past when men had the stature of giants. Today is the day, the eternal now, when conditions round about you have attained the appearance of giants, such as unemployed, the armies of your enemy, your problems, and all things that seem to threaten you. Those are the giants that make you feel to be a grasshopper. But you are told you were first in your own sight a grasshopper, and because of this, you were to the giants a grasshopper. In other words, you can only be to others what you are first to yourself. Therefore, to revalue yourself 
and begin to feel yourself to be the giant, a center of power is to dwarf those former giants and make of them grasshoppers. All the inhabitants of the earth are as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the armies of heaven and among all the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand, nor say unto him, What doest thou? This being spoken of is not the orthodox God sitting in space, but the one and only God, the everlasting Father, your awareness of being. So awake to the power that you are, not as man, but as your true self, a faceless, formless awareness, and free yourself from your self-imposed prison. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they will follow me. Awareness is the good shepherd. While I am aware of being is the sheep that follow me. So good a shepherd is your awareness that it has never lost one of the sheep that you are aware of being. I am the voice calling in the wilderness of human confusion for such as I am aware of being and never shall there come a time when that which I am convinced that I am shall fail to find me. I am is an open door for all that I am to enter. Your awareness of being is Lord and shepherd of your life. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is seen in his true light now to be your consciousness. You could never be in want of proof or lack of evidence of that which you are aware of being. This being true, why not become aware of being great, God-loving, wealthy, healthy, and all attributes that you admire? It is just as easy to possess the consciousness of these qualities as it is to possess their opposites, for you have not your present consciousness because of your world. On the contrary, your world is what it is because of your present consciousness. Simple, is it not? Too simple, in fact, for the wisdom of man that tries to complicate everything. Paul said of this principle, it is to the Greeks or wisdom of this world, foolishness, and to the Jews or those who are looking for signs, a stumbling block with the result that man continues to walk in darkness rather than awake to the being that he is. Man has so long worshipped the images of his own making that at first he finds this revelation blasphemous since it spells death to all his previous beliefs in a God apart from himself. This revelation will bring the knowledge that I and my Father are one, but my Father is greater than I. You are one with your present conception of yourself, but you are greater than that which you are at present aware of being. Before man can attempt to transform his world, he must first lay the foundation, I am the Lord. That is, man's awareness, his consciousness of being, is God. Until this is firmly established so that no suggestion or argument put forward by others can shake it, he will find himself returning to the slavery of his former beliefs. If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. That is, you shall continue to be confused and thwarted until you find the cause of your confusion. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he. That is, that I, John Smith, do nothing of myself but my father or that state of consciousness which i am now one with does the work 
When this is realized, every urge and desire that springs within you shall find expression in your world. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. The I knocking at your door is the urge. The door is your consciousness. To open the door is to become one with that which is knocking by feeling oneself to be the thing desired. To feel one's desire as impossible is to shut the door or deny the urge expression. To rise in consciousness to the naturalness of the thing felt is to swing wide the door and invite this one into embodiment. That is why it is constantly recorded that Jesus left the world of manifestation and ascended unto his Father. Jesus, as you and I, found all things impossible to Jesus as man. But having discovered his Father to be the state of consciousness of the thing desired, he but left behind him the Jesus consciousness and rose into consciousness to that state desired and stood upon it until he became one with it. As he made himself one with that, he became that in expression. This is Jesus' simple message to men. Men are but garments that the impersonal being, I am, the presence that men call God dwells in. Each garment has certain limitations. In order to transcend these limitations and give expressions to that which as man, John Smith, you find yourself incapable of doing, you take your attention away from your present limitation or John Smith conception of yourself and merge yourself to the feeling of being that which you desire. Just how this desire or newly attained consciousness will embody itself, no man knows. For I, or the newly attained consciousness, has ways that ye know not of. Its ways are past finding out. Do not speculate as to the how of this consciousness embodying itself, for no man is wise enough to know the how. Speculation is proof that you have not attained the naturalness of being the thing desired, and so are filled with doubts. You are told, he who lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, that gives to all liberally and upbraided not, and it shall be given unto him. But let him ask, not doubting, for he who doubts is as a wave of the sea that is tossed and battered by the winds. And let not such a one think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. You can see why this statement is made. For only upon the rock of faith can anything be established. If you have not the consciousness of the thing, you have not the cause or foundation upon which thing is erected. A proof of this established consciousness is given you in the words, Thank you, Father. When you come into the joy of thanksgiving so that you actually feel grateful for having received that which is not yet apparent to the senses, you have definitely become one in consciousness with the thing for which you gave thanks. God, your awareness is not mocked. You are ever receiving that which you are aware of being, and no man gives thanks for something which he has not received. Thank you, Father, is not, as it is used by many today, a sort of magical formula. You need never utter aloud the words, Thank you, Father. In applying this principle as you rise in consciousness to the point where you are really grateful and happy for having received the thing desired, you automatically rejoice and give thanks inwardly. You have already accepted the gift, which was but a desire before you rose in consciousness, and your faith is now the substance that shall clothe your desire. 
This rising in consciousness is a spiritual marriage which two shall agree upon being one, and their likeness or image is established on earth. For whatever you ask in my name, the same give I unto you. Whatsoever is quite a large measure. It is unconditional. It does not state if society deems it right or wrong that you should ask it. It rests with you. Do you really want it? Do you desire it? That is all that is necessary. Life will give it to you if you ask in his name. His name is not a name that you pronounce with your lips. You can ask forever in the name of God or Jehovah or Christ Jesus and you will ask in vain. Name means nature. So, when you ask in the nature of a thing, results ever follow. To ask in the name is to rise in consciousness and become one in nature with the thing desired. Rise in consciousness to the nature of the thing and you will become that thing in expression. Therefore, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. Praying, as we have shown you before, is recognition. The injunction to believe that ye receive is first person, present tense. This means that you must be in the nature of the things asked for before you begin, before you can receive them. To get into the nature easily, general amnesty is necessary. We are told, forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you. But if you forgive not, neither will your Father forgive you. This may seem to be some personal God who is pleased or displeased with your action, but this is not the case. Consciousness being God, if you hold in consciousness anything against man, you are binding that condition in your world. But to release man from all condemnation is to free yourself so that you may rise to any level necessary. There is therefore no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Therefore, a very good practice before you enter into your meditation is first to free every man in the world from blame. For law is never violated and you can rest confidently in the knowledge that every man's conception of himself is going to be his reward. So you do not have to bother yourself about seeking whether or not man gets what you consider he should get, for life makes no mistakes and always gives man that which man first gives himself. This brings us to that much abused statement of the Bible on tithing. Teachers of all kinds have enslaved man with this affair of tithing, for not themselves understanding the nature of tithing and being themselves fearful of lack. They have led their followers to believe that a tenth part of their income should be given to the Lord, meaning as they make very clear that when one gives a tenth part of his income to their particular organization, he's giving his tenth part to the Lord or his tithing. But remember, I am the Lord. Your awareness of being is, is the God that you give to and you ever give in this manner. Therefore, when you claim yourself to be anything, you have given that claim or quality to God. And your awareness of being, which is no respecter of persons, will return to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over with all with that quality or attribute which you claim for yourself. Awareness of being is nothing that you could ever name. To claim God to be rich, to be great, to be loved, to be all wise is to define that which cannot be defined. For God is nothing that could ever be named. Tithing is necessary 
and you do tithe with God. But from now on, give to the only God and see to it that you give him the quality that you desire as man to express by claiming yourself to be the great, the wealthy, the loving, the all-wise. Do not speculate as to how you shall express these qualities or claims, for life has a way that you as man know not of. Its ways are past finding out. But I assure you, the day you claim these qualities to the point of conviction, your claims will be honored. There is nothing covered that shall not be uncovered. That which you spoken in secret shall be proclaimed from the housetops. That is, your secret convictions of yourself. These secret claims that no man knows of, when really believed, will be shouted from the housetops in your world. For your convictions of yourself are the words of God within you, which words are spirit and cannot return unto you void, but must accomplish whereunto they are sent. You are at this moment calling out of the infinite that which you are now conscious of being, and not one word of conviction will fail to find you. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. Consciousness is the vine, and those qualities which you are now conscious of being are the branches that you feed and keep alive. Just as a branch has no life except it be rooted in the vine, so likewise things have no life except you be conscious of them. Just as the branch withers and dies if the sap of the vine ceases to flow towards it, so do things in your world pass away if you take your attention from them. Because your attention is as the sap of life that keeps alive and sustains the things of your world. To dissolve a problem that seems so real to you, all that you do is remove your attention from it. In spite of its seeming reality, turn from it in consciousness. Become indifferent and begin to feel yourself to be that which would be the solution of the problem. For instance, if you were imprisoned, no man would have to tell you that you should desire freedom. Freedom, or rather the desire of freedom, will be automatic. So why look behind the four walls of your prison bars? Take your attention from being imprisoned and begin to feel yourself to be free. Feel. Feel it to the point where it is natural. The very second you do so, those prison bars will dissolve. Apply this same principle to any problem. I have seen people who were in debt up to their ears apply this principle and in the twinkling of an eye, debts that were mountainous were removed. I have seen those whom doctors had given up as incurable take their attention away from their problem of disease and begin to feed themselves to be well in spite of the evidence of their sense to the contrary in no time at all. This so-called incurable disease vanished and left no scar. Your answer to whom do you say that I am ever determines your expression. As long as you are conscious of being imprisoned or diseased or poor, so long will you continue to outpicture or express these conditions. When man realizes that he is now that which he is seeking, and begins to claim that he is, he will have the proof of his claim. This cue is given you in words, Whom seek ye? And they answered, Jesus. And the voice said, I am he. Jesus here means salvation or savior. You are seeking to be salvaged from that which is not your problem. I am is he that will save you. If you are hungry, your savior is food. If you are poor, your savior is riches. If you are imprisoned, 
Your savior is freedom. If you are diseased, it will not be a man called Jesus who will save you, but health will become your savior. Therefore claim, I am he. In other words, claim yourself to be the thing desired. Claim it in consciousness, not in words, and consciousness will reward you with your claim. You are told, you shall find me when you feel after me. Well, feel after that quality in consciousness until you feel yourself to be it. When you lose yourself in the feeling of being it, the quality will embody itself in your world. You are healed from your problem when you touch the solution of it. Who has touched me? For I perceive virtue is gone out of me. Yes, the day you touch this being within you, feeling yourself to be cured or healed, virtues will come out of your very self and solidify themselves in your world as healings. It is said, you believe in God, believe also in me, for I am he. Have the faith of God. He made himself one with God and found it not robbery to do the works of God. Go you and do likewise. Yes, begin to believe in your awareness, your consciousness of being to be God. Claim for yourself all the attributes that you have hereto given an, an external God and you will begin to express these claims. For I am not a God afar off. I am nearer than your hands and feet, nearer than your very breathing. I am your awareness of being. I am that in which all that I shall ever be aware of being shall begin and end. For before the world was, I am. And when the world shall cease to be, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. This I am is your awareness. Except the Lord build the house, the labor in vain that build it. The Lord being your consciousness, except that which you seek is established in your consciousness, you will labor in vain to find it. All things must begin and end in consciousness. So, blessed indeed is the man that trusted in himself, for man's faith in God will ever be measured by his confidence in himself. You believe in a God, believe also in me. Put not your trust in men for men, but reflect the being that you are and can only bring to you or do unto you that which you have first done unto yourself. No man take it away my life, I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up. No matter what happens to man in this world, it is never an accident. It occurs under the guidance of an exact and changeless law. No man manifestation comes unto me except the father within me draws him and I and the father are one believe this truth and you will be free man has always blamed others for that which he is I will continue to do so until he find himself as the cause of all I am comes not to destroy but to fulfill I am the awareness within you destroys nothing but ever feel the modes of conception one has of oneself. It is impossible for the poor man to find wealth in this world no matter how he is surrounded with it until he first claims himself to be wealthy. For signs follow, they do not proceed. To constantly kick and complain against the limitations of poverty while remaining poor in consciousness is to play the fool's game. Changes cannot take place from that level of consciousness, for life is constantly outpicturing all levels. Follow the example of the prodigal son. 
realize that you yourself brought about this condition of waste and lack and make the decision within yourself to rise to a higher level where the fatted calf, the ring, and the robe awaits your claim. There was no condemnation of the prodigal son when he had the courage to claim the inheritance as his own. Others will condemn us only as long as we continue in that for which we condemn ourselves. So, happy is the man that condemneth himself not in that which he alloweth. For to life nothing is condemned, all is expressed. Life does not care whether you call yourself rich or poor, strong or weak. It will eternally reward you with that which you claim as true of yourself. The measurements of right and wrong belong to man alone. To life there is nothing right or wrong. As Paul stated in his letters to the Romans, I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So stop asking yourself whether you are worthy or unworthy to receive that which you desire. You as man did not create the desire Your desires are ever fashioned within you because of that you now claim yourself to be. When a man is hungry, without thinking, he automatically desires food. When imprisoned, he automatically desires freedom and so forth. Your desires contain within themselves the plan of self-expression. So, leave all judgment out of the picture and rise in consciousness to the level of your desire and make yourself one with it by claiming it to be so now. For my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Have faith in the unseen claim until the conviction is born within you that it is so. Your confidence in this claim will pay great rewards just a little while and he, the thing desired, will come. But without faith, it is impossible to realize anything. Through faith, the worlds were framed because faith is the substance of the thing hoped for, the evidence of the thing not yet seen. Don't be anxious or concerned as to results, they will follow just as surely as day follows night. Look upon your desires, all of them, as the spoken words of God, and every word or desire a promise. The reason most of us fail to realize our desires is because we are constantly conditioning them. Do not condition your desire. Just accept it as it comes to you. Give thanks for it to the point that you are grateful for having already received it. Then go about your way in peace. Such acceptance of your desire is like dropping fertile seed into prepared soil. For when you can drop the thing desired in consciousness... Confident that it shall appear, you have done all that is expected to you. But to be worried or concerned about the how of your desire maturing is to hold those fertile seeds in a mental grasp and therefore never have dropped them in the soil of confidence. The reason men condition their desires is because they constantly judge after the appearance of being and see things as real, forgetting that the only reality is the consciousness back of them. To see things as real is to deny that all things are possible to God. The man who is imprisoned and see his four walls as real is automatically denying the urge or promise of God within him of freedom. 
A question often asked when this statement is made is, if one's desire is a gift of God, how can you say that if one desires to kill a man, that such a desire is good and therefore God sent? In answer to this, let me say that no man desires to kill another. What he does desire is to be freed from such a one. But because he does not believe that the desire to be freed from such a one contains within itself the powers of freedom, he conditions that desire and sees the only way to express such freedom is to destroy the man, forgetting that the life wrapped within the desire has ways that he, as man, knows not of. Its ways are past finding out. Thus, man distorts the gifts of God through his lack of faith. Problems are the mountains spoken of that can be removed if one has but the faith of a grain of a mustard seed. Men approach their problem as did the old lady who, attending service and hearing the priest say, if you had faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you would say unto yonder mountain, be thou removed, and it shall be removed, and nothing is impossible to you. That night, as she said her prayers, she quoted this part of the scriptures and retired to bed in what she thought was faith. On rising in the morning, she rushed to the window and exclaimed, I knew that old mountain would still be there. For this is how man approaches his problems. He knows that they are still going to confront him. And because life is no respecter of person, and destroys nothing, it continues to keep alive that which he is conscious of being. Things will disappear only as man changes in consciousness. Deny it if you will. It still remains a fact that consciousness is the only reality. And things but mirror that that which you are in consciousness. So the heavenly state you are seeking will be found only in consciousness, for the kingdom of heaven is within you. As the will of heaven is ever done on earth, you are today living in the heaven that you have established within you. For here on this very earth, your heaven reveals itself. The kingdom of heaven really is at hand. Now is the accepted time. So create a new heaven, enter into a new state of consciousness, and a new earth will appear. The former things shall pass away, they shall not be remembered, not come into mind anymore. For behold, I, your consciousness, come quickly, and my reward is with me. I am nameless but will take upon myself every name, nature, that you call me. Remember, it is you, yourself, that I speak of as me. So every conception that you have of yourself, that is every deep conviction you have of yourself, is that which you shall appear as being. For I am not fooled. God is not mocked. Now let me instruct you in the art of fishing. It is recorded that the disciples fished all night and caught nothing. Then Jesus came upon the scene and told them to cast their nets in once more into the same waters that only a moment before were barren. And this time their nets were bursting with the catch. This story is taking place in the world today, right within you, the reader. For you have within you all the elements necessary to go fishing. But until you find that Jesus Christ, your awareness is Lord, you will fish as did the disciples in the night of human darkness. That is, you will fish for things, thinking things to be real, and will fish with the human bait, which is a struggle and an effort, trying to make contact 
with this one and that one, trying to coerce this being or the other being, and all such effort will be in vain. But when you discover your awareness of being to be Christ Jesus, you will let him direct your fishing. You will fish in consciousness for the things that you desire. For your desire will be the fish that you will catch because your consciousness is the only living reality. You will fish in the deep waters of consciousness. If you would catch that which is beyond your present capacity, you must launch out into deeper waters. For within your present consciousness, such fish or desires cannot swim. To launch out into deeper waters, you leave behind you all that is now your present problem or limitation by taking your attention away from it. Turn your back completely upon every problem and limitation that you now possess. Dwell upon just being by saying, I am to yourself. Continue to declare to yourself that you just are. Do not condition the statement or this declaration. Just continue to feel yourself to be and without warning, you will find yourself slipping the anchor that tied you to the shallow of your problems and moving into the deep. This is usually accompanied with the feelings of expansion. You will feel yourself expand as though you were actually growing. Don't be afraid for courage is necessary. You are not going to die to anything by your former limitations but they are going to die as you move away from them for they live only in your consciousness. In this deep or expanded consciousness, you will find yourself to be the power that you had never dreamt of before. Things desired before you shoved off from the shore of limitation are the fish you are going to catch in this deep. Because you have lost all consciousness of your problems and barriers, it is now the easiest thing in the world to feel yourself to be with the things desired. Because I am, your consciousness is the resurrection and the life. You must attach this resurrecting power that you are to the thing desired if you would make it appear and live in your world. Now you begin to assume the nature of a thing desired by feeling, I am wealthy, I am free, I am strong. When these feels are fixed within yourself, your formless being will take upon itself the forms of the things felt. You become crucified with the feelings of wealth, freedom, strength. Remain buried in the stillness of these convictions. Then as a thief in the night, when you least expect, these qualities will be resurrected in your world as living realities. The world shall touch you and see that you are flesh and blood, for you shall begin to bear fruit of the nature of these qualities newly appropriated. This is the art of successful fishing for the manifestations of life. Successful realization of the thing desired is also told us in the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Here it is recorded that Daniel, while in the lion's den, turned his back upon the lions and looked towards the light coming from above, that the lions remained powerless and Daniel's faith in God saved him. This also is your story, and you too must do as Daniel did. If you found yourself in a lion's den, you would have no other concern but lions. You would not be thinking of one thing in the world but your problem, which problem would be lions. Yet, you're told that Daniel turned his back upon them and looked towards the light that was his God. 
If we would follow the example of Daniel, we would, while imprisoned within the den of poverty or sickness, take our attention away from our problems of debt or sickness and dwell upon the thing we seek. If we do not look back in consciousness to our problems, but continue in faith, believing ourselves to be that which we seek, we too will find our prison walls open and the things sought, yes, whatsoever things realized. Another story is told us of the widow and the three drops of oil. The prophet asked the widow, what have ye in the house? She replied, three drops of oil. He then said, go, borrow vessels, close the door, and after you have returned into your house and begin to pour. And she poured from three drops of oil into all the borrowed vessels, filling them to capacity with oil remaining. You, the reader, are this widow. You have not a husband to impregnate you or make you fruitful, for a widow is a barren slate. Your awareness is now the Lord or prophet that has become your husband. Follow the example of the widow who instead of recognizing an emptiness or nothingness recognized the something, three drops of oil. Then the command to her, go within and close the door, that is, shut the door of your senses that tell you of the empty measures, the debts, the problems. When you have taken your attention away completely by shutting out the evidence of the senses, begin to feel the joy symbolized by oil of having received the things desired. When the agreement is established within you so that all doubts and fears have passed away, then you too will fill all the empty vessels of your life and will have an abundance running over. Recognition is the power that conjures in the world. Every state that you have ever recognized, you have embodied. That which you are now recognizing as true of yourself today is that which you are experiencing. So, be as the widow and recognize joy. No matter how little the beginnings of recognition, and you will be generously rewarded, for the world is a magnified mirror, magnifying everything that you are conscious of being. I am the Lord God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What a glorious revelation. Your awareness now revealed as the Lord thy God. Come, awake from your dream of being imprisoned. Realize that the earth is yours and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwells within. You have become so enmeshed in the belief that you are man that you have forgotten the glorious being that you are. Now, with your memory restored, decree the unseen to appear and it shall appear and all things are compelled to respond to the voice of God, your awareness of being. The world is at your command. Now, this brings us to the end of the first part of the reading. Now, on to the second part, which is fundamentals. With so vast a subject, it is indeed a difficult task to summarize in a few hundred words that which I consider the most basic ideas on which those who seek a true understanding of metaphysics should now concentrate. I shall do what I can in the shape of three fundamentals. These fundamentals are self-observation, definition of aim, and detachment. The purpose of true metaphysics is to bring about a rebirth, a radical psychological change in the individual. 
Such a change cannot take place until the individual first discovers the self that he would love to change. This discovery can be made only through an uncritical observation of his reactions to life. The sum total of these reactions defines the individual's state of consciousness. And it is the individual's state of consciousness that attracts the situations and circumstances of his life. So the starting point of true metaphysics on its practical side is self-observation. In order to discover one's reactions to life, reactions which form one's secret self, the cause of the phenomena of life. With Emerson, I accept the fact that man surrounds himself with the true image of himself, what we are that only can we see. There is a definite connection between what is outer and what is inner in man. And it is ever our inner states that attracts our outer life. Therefore, the individual must always start with himself. It's oneself that must be changed. Man in his blindness is quite satisfied with himself, but heartily dislikes the circumstances and situations of his life. He feels this way, not knowing that the cause of his displeasure lies not in the condition nor the person with whom he is displeased, but in the very self he likes so much. Not realizing that he surrounds himself with the true image of himself. And that's what he is, that's only can he see. He is shocked when he discovers that it has always been his own deceitfulness that made him suspicious of others. Self-observation would reveal this deceitful one in all of us. And this one must be accepted before there can be any transformation of ourselves. At this moment, try to notice your inner state. To what thoughts are you consenting? With what feelings are you identified? You must be careful where you are within yourself. Most of us think that we are kind and loving, generous and tolerant, forgiving and noble, but an uncritical observation of our reactions to life will reveal a self that is not at all kind and loving, generous and tolerant, forgiving and noble. And it is this self that we must first accept and then set about to change. Rebirth depends on inner work on oneself. No one can be reborn without changing this self. Anytime that an entirely new set of reactions enters into a person's life, a change of consciousness has taken place. A spiritual rebirth has occurred. Having discovered through an uncritical observation of your reactions to life, a self must be changed. You must now formulate an aim. That is, you must define the one you would like to be instead of the one you truly are in secret. With this aim clearly defined, you must, throughout your conscious waking day, notice your every reaction in regard to this aim. The reason for this is that everyone lives in a definite state of consciousness, which state of consciousness we have already described as the sum total of his reactions to life. Therefore, in defining an aim, you are defining a state of consciousness, which like all states of consciousness, must have its reactions to life. For example, if a rumor or an idle remark could cause an anxious reaction in one person and no reaction in another, 
This is positive proof that the two people are living in two different states of consciousness. If you define your aim as a noble, generous, secure, kindly individual, knowing that all things are states of consciousness, you can easily tell whether you are faithful to your aim in life by watching your reactions to the daily events of life, if you are faithful to your talent, if you are faithful to your ideal, your reactions will conform to your aim. For you will be identified with your aim and therefore will be thinking from your aim. If your reactions are not in harmony with your ideal, it is a sure sign that you are separated from your ideal and are only thinking of it. Assume that you are the loving one you want to be and notice your reactions throughout the day in regard to that assumption for your reaction will tell you the state from which you are operating. Now this is where the third fundamental detachment comes in. Having discovered that everything is a state consciousness made visible and having defined that particular state which we want to make visible, we now set about the task of entering such a state for we must move psychological from where we are to where we desire to be. The purpose of practicing detachment is to separate us from our present reactions to life and attach us to our aim in life. This inner separation must be developed by practice. At first, we seem to have no power to separate ourselves from undesirable inner states, simply because we have always taken every mood, every reaction as natural and have become identified with them. When we have no idea that our reactions are only states of consciousness from which it is possible to separate ourselves, we go round and round in the same circle of problems, not seeing them as inner states, but as outer situations. We practice detachment or inner separation that we may escape from the circle of our habitual reactions to life. That is why we must formulate an aim and constantly notice ourselves in regard to that aim. This teaching begins with self-observation. Secondly, it asks, what do you want? And then it teaches detachment from all negative states and attachment to your aim. This last state, attachment to your aim, is accomplished by frequently assuming the feeling of your wish fulfilled. We must practice separating ourselves from our negative moods and thoughts in the midst of all the troubles and disasters of daily life. No one can be different from what he is now unless he begins to separate himself from his present reactions and identify himself with his aim. Detachment from negative states and assumption of the wish fulfilled must be practiced in the midst of all the blessings and cursings of life. The way of true metaphysics lies in the midst of all that is going on in life. We must constantly practice self-observation, thinking from our aim, and detachment from negative moods and thoughts if we would be doers of truth instead of mere hearers. Practice these three fundamentals and you will rise to higher and higher levels of consciousness. Remember, always it is your state of consciousness that attracts your life. Start climbing, Neville. Now this brings us to the end of the reading of this incredible book at your command by Neville Gordon. As always, 
I'm curious to know what resonated with you as you listened to the reading of this amazing, fantastic, life-changing book. It is my prayer that this book has blessed you as much as it has blessed me. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the like button, subscribe to this channel, and share this content with anyone who you know would benefit of it. I am committed to bring you quality content three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Till we see again, it's goodbye and God bless.